It's freaking cold. You got frostbite yet? In the frigid Canadian north, young pilots seeking adventure. That's why all us guys are up here. Battle the elements in World War II planes. Oh, On this episode, Joe boils over. I don't know if we're gonna do it. Okay, let's cancel the whole thing. Mikey spins his wheels. Mother Nature just shit her pants. <laughs> and Chuck bails. I wanna quit. <laughs> Every summer for the past 15 years, Buffalo Airways has battled wildfires across northern Canada. The backbone of the airline's firefighting business has been a fleet of 70-year-old Douglas DC-4s. But the old piston pounders from World War II no longer meet government specifications. So, what I'm going to do so is company owner Joe McBrien is in a bind. You like what you know best, and we, we always knew the radial engine the best, so. With the DC-4s being phased out, Joe needs more jet-fueled Electras to service firefighting. Clacking of the horseshoes on the city streets are over, aren't they? It's all part of a shakeup at the company as Joe is forced to modernize the operation. He's brought in a new manager to implement new systems. Schedule who does what route. And that's stirring up some tensions. To make change, people are going to get upset. We're all just freaking stupid. In Hay River, the first of the DC-4s on the chopping block is Tanker 56. Buffalo Joe wants to move it to its retirement home in Red Deer, Alberta. Joe will salvage this plane for parts. He's got stripped down DC-4s and boneyards around all his hangars. Dealing with fucking worn out junk. And veteran mechanic Chuck Adams isn't happy being pulled off Buffalo's newer turboprop planes to prep this DC-4 for its final flight before it's mothballed. OK, this is the one. Now, I wonder if this high tension leads to fried. I wouldn't be surprised. God damn it. I'm gonna stress out, man. F***ing snap. This is like a make work project. I guess we got nothing to do in Yellowknife, so Joel's giving us a job. This one's been sitting for a couple months now. We gotta pre-oil it, burp it, you know, all the shit I don't really wanna be doing. But Chuck has no choice. And when he tries to start one of the engines, Oh, this is great. That means I gotta start with that engine now. It's not firing. How do you kick it over? Give it a shot of ether. I'm gonna change this mag. Boy, we'll be around here forever. Chuck's under the gun. The flight crew is arriving soon, expecting him to have the plane ready to fly. Oh, this is bullshit. This thing's cross-threaded in there. Spare parts, man. Lots of it. Chuck replaces the magneto the generator that supplies power to the spark plugs. They're on four. They're on four. But Chuck doesn't get the result he was hoping for. I think the mag that I took off was out of time. It wasn't lined up properly. So he reinstalls the magneto. This time, the Pratt & Whitney radial engine purrs like a 1,300 horsepower kitten. Hey, you guys want to throw a tent on that one for me? Acting Chief Pilot Justin Simley and Co-Pilot Sean Barry arrive from Yellowknife and find Chuck scrambling to get back on track. Put the five bottom plugs in. 
we show up and he's got one engine going. I'm kind of going, well, oh, you know, I'm here to take the airplane and you got 25% of the engines running. Well, I got nothing happening. I'll change this mag. F it. I'll be here all day. Go grab one of them ones out of the fucking hangar. Now, before I go putting this on, let's make sure all this is lined up so I don't look like a fucking idiot again. Chuck seems to be able to make things go when you need him to. You know, I always call him the mag master. He does, uh, he does a hell of a job. Finally, after installing another magneto, fueling up, and de-icing the wings, Chuck has the DC-4 ready to fly. They're all run now. He comes up to me, he's like, you get in that airplane and you get going to Red Deer. I'm like, Chuck, I'm here to take the airplane to Red Deer. I've been waiting on you all day. Have they amended the forecast? Hey, Chuck, I got to take those engine tents. Weather's gone down in Red Deer a little bit, but uh, it's still good enough to go, so uh, we're going to go. As Tanker 56 taxis down the runway for its trip to the Boneyard at Red Deer, the era of Buffalo's piston-pounding firefighters is nearly over. Oh, put a it's rock and roll. Go to 30. RPMs are a little low. 22 or so. 80, 80 knots. My fault. 22, okay. Here up. Leaving hours behind schedule, Justin and Sean will land in Red Deer after nightfall. And visibility may be poor. This is supposed to be a pretty thick layer of cloud. Is it? Yeah, let's ask him for four blocking five. The trip from Hay River to Red Deer, Alberta stretches a thousand kilometers almost due south. For most of the three hour flight, it's clear skies and smooth sailing. Not a bad day for flying up here. Yeah, it's beautiful here. But the enjoyment doesn't last. Nearing their destination, the clouds basically just dropped to the ground and, uh, and we had the deck below us. All at once, it's like flying over the North Pole. Justin knows that if the ceiling is too low, landing could be dicey. But then... We got to Red Deer, and actually it opened up nice, you know. I, I kind of looked down and uh, flew right over the strip, saw the strip. The runway's inside. Check, field inside. A little hazy here. Suddenly, a low-lying bank of fog blocks their view. Basically, the runway started to disappear on me, so... I can barely see this thing. going to beam the runway and you can see it just fine. And all of a sudden, you know, poof, poof, it starts to disappear on you. You go, oh, OK, well, we better do something now. Jeez, it's low here. That fog will bite you in the ass, man. Just tell them where the fish. Just hang on, don't tell them anything yet. Okay. With the runway obscured, Justin changes the game plan. We added uh, climb power, selected the gear up, went to approach flap and just basically did a left-hand orbit. Left turn, I go back to cruise, please. He aborts the landing and starts a go round. But there's danger in circling so low. Yeah, there's that tower to the northwest of this airport that's in like a thousand feet of the ground. And... It's not like going up to Cambridge Bay where the hill that was over there a hundred years ago is still there, right? I mean, you know, you go down, you go down south now and there's cell phone towers everywhere. By the time Justin comes around, the fog bank has moved east. Okay, I gotta descend here. Okay. 90, 94. Tanker 56 touches down in Red Deer. Just stayed on the approach and did our thing and, and uh, worked out pretty good, so. With the first of Joe's DC-4s taken out of service, He's finally beginning the shift to the jet-fueled Electra. Back at Buffalo headquarters in Yellowknife, 
Chuck Adams is still feeling frazzled. And we're all nutcases, can't you tell? Look at us around here, he blew me. Things are a little crazy these days for Buffalo Joe McBrien as well. As he struggles to keep his airline competitive, he's being forced to sell off some of the vintage planes he loves. He has an interested buyer for a PBY Canso, an old plane that hasn't been used for years. And he needs two mechanics to go to Hay River right away to get the Canso ready for inspection. Joe's decision to move forward on the Canso sale has caught everyone off guard, most of all his son Rod. I want two people for Hay River for the Canso. It was the fourth for a start. I wanted two and two. Forget that I've been right. talking about this cancer for over 10 days. I haven't even heard about it until this morning. Let's That's just right. stop and I'm going to reconsider this whole thing. All right? I asked you this morning. You want to send them tonight? You said, well, hold on. I, I wanted to send them. I didn't know who I was going to send. I wanted two people. I wanted well, them to decide. Well, at noon, we didn't even know if we were going to do it. OK, let's cancel the whole thing. thing. Well, why do you have to get the angry? The cancel's not for sale. Well, why do you have to get angry? Good. When Joe makes up his mind, regardless of what it is, if he's selling something or buying something or changing anything, when he decides that's what he wants, he wants action. He wants results right now at this moment. He never really let anybody know until he made a decision and then expected everybody to jump. Chuck's getting tired of the constant upheaval in the hangar. Chaos and mayhem. You know when everything's falling apart? Because everybody else is running around freaking out, turning nothing into a big fucking issue, you know? I can't handle that. The tension at Buffalo is becoming too much for Chuck, and he's sick of working on the underutilized Electra. I'm a babysitter, man. Just fucking relax. Okay, I'm not an engineer or a fucking pilot or a flight engineer. I'm a goddamn overpaid babysitter. Cancel the whole fucking operation. Buffalo Joe McBrien is stressed out. The cancel will not leave Hay River, and that electro will not leave England. But his decree doesn't stand. He knows he has to sell an old PBY Canso, a World War II era water bomber, to help pay for four new engines on an Electra that he bought in the UK. He's selling the PBY he doesn't want to, so he can fund the purchase of an Electra, which he doesn't really like. So no wonder he's upset. Joe's heart has always been with his classic radial engine warbirds, like this DC-3 he's flown his entire career. The DC-3 in the north is a symbol of strength and continuity. But industry demand for newer, faster aircraft is forcing Joe's hand, and he's in it for the long haul. You sit down to a game of cards, how long are you going to stay at the game? If you fold your cards after the first couple bad hands, it's a very short game. He's reluctantly investing in Electra's, sleek, fast, turboprop airliners from the 1950s, yet a quantum leap from his piston pounders. Times change only because we're running out of fuel. If we have to go any distance at all, jet fuel's only fuel is going to be available to us. The jet-fueled Electra enables Joe to compete for lucrative contracts hauling cargo and fighting forest fires. But at a million dollars each to buy and $5,000 an hour to fly, Joe needs deep pockets to play in this game. Many, many businesses come and go because the player does not want to stay in the game. Joe's new senior manager, Dwayne Hicks, is intent on bringing in new business with the Electras, but getting them up and running is expensive. The Electra will be good for Buffalo in the future because it's part of the, the fire contract, so it, there is work for it. But to get to that point, you know, you have to get it tanked, you got to get STCs, you know, it's a long road to follow and probably looking at a million dollar budget. Joe is caught in a cash flow crunch. He needs to fund the Electra upgrades and selling his last Canso will help. The price tag? $300,000. He wants two mechanics to prep the Canso for sale right away. I asked Curtis this morning number two. He said, why don't you take one and one of those guys can help you? But I got to go through a pissing match over it. I don't want to do it. We were told to wait. 
I didn't tell them wait. I never did I tell them. I asked three times. You know? Like, so what do you want, if you want it back up on their side? I'm not backing up. I'm just saying, yeah. let's make a plan. Or we're going to pre oil it, get it running, get it ready to go. Mechanic James Dojak and apprentice Curtis Dyson drew the short straws to go to Hay River. You never go down for the job that you're supposed to be there for. It always ends up being three or four more other jobs. It's to be expected. They say two days, well, you can count on two weeks. Chuck Adams has dodged a bullet. He doesn't have to return to Hay River to help James fix up the canso. I'll f take his count show them his ass. As chief mechanic on the Electras for the past two years, he pinned his hopes to the mighty turboprop becoming the flagship of Buffalo's fleet. All we've done in the last two years is just move old airplanes around. We should have been working on that Electra continuously. But that hasn't happened, despite Joe buying two more Electras. Why does he spend the money? Let's get an airplane ready. Let's get some people trained. Let's get some pilots trained. Nothing's happening. Joe seems ambivalent about moving on to the turboprops. He does not have a service of electrical flying right now. It's always shut down. I'm tired of going in there and hearing that shutting it down shit. Chuck could be reaching the end of his rope. At the Buffalo compound in Hay River, mechanic James Dojak sizes up the can soap Joe is selling. This airplane's been sitting here in Hay since 2004. And these have become a collector's dream. It's amazing this thing used to bomb U-boats. Back in 1935, the first BBYs took to the water and the air, a milestone in the history of aviation. BBY, the Navy calls her, B for patrol, B for bomber, and Y, the symbol of consolidated aircraft for maintenance. Canadian-built PBYs were known as Cansos. Elsewhere, they were Catalinas. The amphibious flying boats proved invaluable during World War II. With phenomenal range and the entire ocean as its runway, the PBY excelled at tracking down enemy ships, including the notorious German battleship Bismarck. What we've got to do is get these engines running. Minimal work. I like it. There's no time to lose. The potential buyer is expected to arrive any day. But when James takes a closer look at the engines. Holy f you got a shit off this thing? Holy f this place blue shit, eh? It's everywhere. After six years in the yard, this vintage canso has become a giant bird's nest. With the prospective buyers already on their way, Joe needs this overhaul done quickly. The future of his Electra program depends on this sale. It's crunch time. With buyers on their way, a last minute tune up on a Canso water bomber that Joe needs to sell right away is turning into a major undertaking. Holy f you found a shit on this thing? Mechanic James Dojak has his hands full. Back in the main hangar. That's what we'll do. New senior manager Dwayne Hicks is trying to put Buffalo operations in order. I've been in this business a long time, and I have the experience I can make stuff happen. Would I like control? Sure. Be good. Do I want to step on toes? No. Dwayne won't be stepping on Mikey's toes. Mikey's decided he needs to escape. Yeah, Buffalo is so overpowering and so demanding that it's very important for you to have stuff that is, you know, a release that doesn't really involve green airplanes. So, he's fled south to the great outdoors with a couple of his buddies for a hunting adventure. It's, uh, hey, remember hip waders? <laughs> the safe size. You can find the safe size for those things. <laughs> it's perfect. For Mikey, ripping it up in the backcountry is the great escape. We're out here quadding, you know, get away from the hangar for a bit, have some fun. You know, there's no airplanes out here, which is nice, so we're enjoying the, all what Mother Nature has to offer. 
And nothing says back to nature like plowing through the bush on a 4x4 moon buggy. Mother Nature just shit her pants. <laughs> we were bushwhacking, going through trails, you know, cutting trees down. It was really fun. Now. Buffalo Joe is moving in on a big sale. He's flying Bob Dick, a prospective buyer, and engineer Russ Popel to Hay River to check out a Canso water bomber. Bob Dick, he had always phoned me and always kept in touch with me about buying that airplane. It came to the point where he could offer a much better home than I had for it and put it back to use. There she is, climb in her, have a look around. Joe expected to show Bob and Russ a plane fit to fly, but mechanic James Dojak has already hit problems. And, uh, we got to change the cow flap actuator on the left, and uh, the throttle cable seems to be a little binding on the, the right, so we'll check that out tomorrow. Joe can't afford to have anything upset this sale. It's a good airplane, probably the best around. It's a perfect airplane, doesn't matter. This sale is crucial to pay for an upgrade on another plane. So Joe needs this deal wrapped up fast. I imagine they'll mess around here all day tomorrow and at least Saturday, you know. But at Buffalo, things rarely right, go good. as planned. Oh, you see you gentlemen in the morning. Okay, okay thanks. See you. On the second morning of their outdoor adventure, Mikey and his buddies hit the trail before sunrise. We got up early this morning, and uh, we went to see if we could spot a moose. When we see a moose, I think everyone's going to you know, get see all Bullwinkle. excited. We're and... going to kill Bullwinkle. <laughs> We're going to kill Bullwinkle. <laughs> I'm not the world's biggest hunter. I tend to cheer for the animals. I'm the first one to you know, eat, eat the biggest chunk of red meat I could possibly have. I'm not the first one to shoot an animal. You look for holes like this, right? These are old. See them right there? Yeah. That's a uh, fresh cow moose tracks. He could be standing right over there. She could be. We'll wait a little while and throw a few calls out there and wait a little while longer, see if we get a call back. You see that? So as a female moose, how do you rank yourself? Are you a seven or an eight? <laughs> Trigger fingers twitching, the hunters wait. But the elusive moose is nowhere to be found. We stood around and Trevor did some moose calls. Austin had the gun ready, and I was the spotter. I was out trying to see if I could find anything. The only thing we saw was a couple squirrels, really. But that's not enough to stop true outdoorsmen from enjoying a feast at the end of the hunt. Gasoline, buddy. Oh, shit. You can bring a body in this fire. A piss poor hunter brings lots of food into the bush, and that's what we did. Uh, we had more food than anything, so we just cooked store-bought food instead of, uh, you know, living off the lands. Maybe next year we'll be a little bit more lucky. So this is a perfect time to get away from the all-night, and probably be the only time I get away until around Christmas. So it's good to uh, get out and uh, live life a little bit. In Hay River. Work on the Canso continues. Prospective buyer Bob Dick is a lifelong aviator who spent years flying water bombers. Recently, he started dreaming of running tourist flights along the coast of British Columbia using a vintage Canso. About a year ago, I came to the realization that uh, if I didn't do something, uh, all these aircraft would disappear. And the next thing you know, we'd be losing out on a great piece of aviation history in Canada. Bob is putting a lot on the line to buy a Canso. I thought, well, what the heck, I don't even really need the house. So I sold it uh, this last summer and uh, rearranged my assets a wee bit to put together the cash to buy this baby. But the Canso is showing the effects of sitting idle for six years. The gas tanks are filled with water. Nothing but water. And the engine oil needs to be flushed. What the f is going on in here? I'm going to need another bucket. 
Give her! No, oh, I'll plug it in, plug it in, plug it in! What about my legs are getting numb again? It's tough work. By the end of the day, James can barely walk. Ever since I froze my knees in Norman Wells, I haven't been the same since. Two winters ago, James had to change a C-46 tailwheel on a frozen airstrip in Norman Wells. The pain has stayed with him ever since. My knees ache pretty bad, and uh, I feel like I'm 80 years old sometimes. And as new problems with the Canso pop up, James could be in for even more pain. Back at the Yellowknife hangar, Buffalo Joe is anxious about the Canso sale. So it doesn't take much to set him off, even something as small as his mechanics using a diesel forklift inside the hangar. I just spent a million dollars wiping up this hangar, and I'm going to black the shit out of it with this thing in here. You know, look at the black smoke in the air now. We'll open the doors, or take them outside and do it, push them back in. Because, boy, this shit is black. Day to day operation, man. If he ain't flipping, it ain't normal. Mechanic Chuck Adams is finding it ever harder to stay motivated about working at Buffalo. I just heard a half an hour of bullshit. I can't continue on trying to make it work when I got the owner flipping out and shutting it down. That's a good engineer. He comes here, punches in, and this day does all something. <laughs> I haven't seen Chuck all afternoon. Like, where is Chuck? Where, indeed, his disappearing act is threatening to become permanent. 50 years old. I got to wonder what I'm doing with my life. Huge goddamn bullshit. He told me he didn't feel, he didn't feel that he'd been treated um, fairly at Buffalo. We have a blow once a year. Just, you know, let each other know that we're there. But this time, it feels different, and there's no mistaking the smell of a burning fuse. I asked those guys. It's and it's a class with Rod over Chuck's work schedule that does it. Chuck thinks that it's everybody else's fault, and it's very simple. You go to work, you get paid. You don't go to work, you don't get paid. You can't figure that out. Blames Buffalo is out on the Any time for that. Rod's pretty compassionate, but when he gets to a point, he's, he's even more ruthless than the old man, for sure. So I just said, you either come here at 8 o'clock in the morning and leave home at 5 like everybody else on the planet, or leave. I'm sick of this goddamn shit. I want the truth, I quit. After working at Buffalo Airways for a large part of his career, Chuck Adams is walking. Meanwhile, news of Chuck Adams' sudden departure from Buffalo Airways spreads around the hangar. Uh, apparently yesterday, uh, Chuck came into the uh, to work, and he was a little disgruntled. And Rod, being the director of maintenance and managing his program, uh, he didn't feel competent enough that Chuck was uh, was physically capable and mentally capable of uh, carrying out any duties yesterday. And my brother says, if you don't want to be here, go. And uh, Chuck says, are you fired me? And Rod's like, no, if you don't want to be here, why are you here? And all this stuff. So it's one of those, did he get fired? Did he quit? You know, there's no one in the hangar knows. Rod doesn't even know. The altercation has left Rod badly stung. He's a fucking whiny baby. We don't have to have a big fucking drama soap show. I don't have a penny in the bank, but I'll live life on the edge. I'm not going to let some person repress me. Just no way. But everyone at Buffalo has seen it all before. Oh, he's pissed off about something. That's a normal thing. It's kind of overdue. So maybe he'll come back, maybe he won't. I already quit, I don't know. Wait and see. Chuck's come and gone before. Sometimes he needs a sabbatical. Sometimes we see him again in the short term. Sometimes we see him again in the long term. It's a, it's a, a way of life with people. But Chuck's absence will be felt at Buffalo. Chuck is a big piece to the electric program. You know, he's a smart, smart guy, and he knows what he's doing. He knows the airplane in and out. Losing Chuck will hit mechanic Adam Smith hard, too. 
Chuck was training him on the Electra. Now, Adam is on his own. It's gonna be an uphill battle with no Charlie. Uh, I don't have that 15 years of experience to fall back on. Meanwhile, Chuck has been trying to keep busy. Where the f is that goddamn thing? He now has time on his hands instead of grease, and he spends most of it at home, alone. Every time me and the wife are gonna get divorced or something, I start building this model. It's been a while since I worked on it because we haven't been getting divorced in the last probably six, seven years or so. Oh, yeah. Behind all the bluster Chuck was famous for at Buffalo, there's a family guy struggling to get through a tough situation. I could be looking for a job right now. I'll go south if I have to. I really don't want to pull my kids out of school because that's all my dad did being in the aviation business, pull us out of schools, move around. Well, we're all stressed out, especially my wife. She's worried about my paycheck not coming in. <laughs> when Chuck walked out of Buffalo, he left something behind in the hangar. I got to go in my toolbox and I got to sneak in there in stealth mode to get it out of there, what's left of it. Chuck needs to land another job soon. While you can take Chuck out of Buffalo, the question is, can you take Buffalo out of Chuck? Another day in Hay River. Mechanic James Dojak is trying to get a Canso water bomber looking good for a prospective buyer. But things aren't going well. Bob Dick and his engineer Russ Popel fire up engine number two. Something's wrong. It doesn't sound right. Bag of shit, really. You know, it coughed, it hiccuped, it blew smoke. It wasn't a happy engine. James's premonition about the job taking longer than expected is starting to come true. Well, I guess we'll just change some more. In an airplane like this, of this vintage, that's been sitting in the field for six, seven years, you want the job done right. So when in doubt, change it out. So he decides to replace all the spark plugs. We were changing plugs, and one of our plugs seized in the cylinder. And uh, when we were taking it out, it snapped. I laid it out uh, for Bob there, and he opted to change the cylinder. So that's what we're doing today. There you go. And that's not all. The carb's been acting up on this engine, too. So we're doing a carb change, too. Every time you fix a problem, it just seemed like another one was popping up. Too much. Ready? Yeah. I'll go fish for these uh, parts. Getting it popped again. It's heavy after a couple minutes. Couple hours here, a couple hours there. There, there we go. That was the field. Russ used to always tell us a clean airplane is a happy airplane. Maybe that cures the problem. Cross your fingers. Carb change? Hours later, the engine is back together, ready for a test start. That was nice. You see that smoke ring? <laughs> Great work. Okay. Uh, James wants to keep prospective buyer Bob Dick and his engineer Russ Popel happy, but they want to make sure they're not buying a mechanical nightmare. So they decide to do a more detailed check of all the systems and take it for a spin on the runway. Here at Buffalo Base here, we'd like to do a partial takeoff. And then a reject. Okay, got gotcha. ya. Your compass system doesn't seem to be working right, eh? Uh, nope. Number two is not uh, playing. Getting better, but it's uh, still acting up, right? Engine number two still needs some tweaking. An easy task for James. Success. Yeah, let's uh, just eyeball it and wrap it. Kick. And we're thinking, oh, finally we can go home. But the relief is short-lived. Man, I can't believe this. I just never seen nothing like that. Incredible. On our leak check after shutdown, there's a crack in the new jug we just replaced. 
from the spark plug hole down to the intake. We gotta change it again. We're gonna be here another day and a bit. But Bob doesn't know that yet. What do you wanna do? Red here. Oh, you're way behind the times. That oh. shoulder's cracked. No! No fing way. Yeah. We all lost it. You know, it, the swearing comes out, the cursing, the kicking, the, the rocks and the tarmac. That's where frustration hit its peak. The guys were counting going, going home the yellow knife and we we're counting on going to Red Deer today. And uh, so we're a little disappointed. You guys are just uh, walking tragedies around here. Well, the jug we changed was cracked. I'll let you know if anything else bad happens. If there are any more setbacks, these buyers could be headed for the exit. Dawn in Hay River. With luck, the last dawn this Canso will ever spend here. Buffalo's tenacious mechanic, James Dojak, has replaced a second cylinder, trying to salvage a vital sale for Buffalo. And this morning's run-up brings smiles. Sounds good to me. Whatever it was, we cured it. <laughs> Just change enough parts, sooner or later it'll go away. With a top up of oil, she's finally ready for a test flight. So airborne again, one chapter of Buffalo Airways history is drawing to a close. Well, you guys happy? Let's fuel and get out of Dodge. Great. The buyer is happy and the deal is clinched. The test flight went really well. Everything, numbers were bang on. Everything worked. So we're just gonna fuel up and uh, head for Prince George. Take care, guys. See you later. Uh, hey, River, it's uh, Fox Bat Uniform Alpha Whiskey uh, 5 3. Well, Fox Uniform Alpha Whiskey, wind is 2 0 0 at 10. For James, there's a special satisfaction in working so hard to get an old Canso running so smoothly. We're talking about an airplane that used to bomb submarines for fuck's sakes, okay? When it flies over, that's the reward right there. It's flying, and it's flying the way it should fly. And for Buffalo, the reward is locking up a deal to help buy another Electra. With James in Hay River and Chuck gone, it's been a tough week for Rod. Want to go in the rocker? When I'm home with Baby Ray, I get an opportunity to just let the world go, and I just concentrate on being a father, and then just uh, try to do things with her. And for some reason, everything goes Choo, gone. This isn't your first night out. This is my first night out. Is it really? Yeah. Tonight, Rod is flying solo, while Sasha is heading out to a wine gala with her friends. We're not going to phone for anything. We're going to be OK. You're going to be OK? Yeah, we'll be OK. Just like an airplane, you just got to make sure everything's ready before you, you attempt anything. OK, bye, guys. OK, bye. For their big night out, the ladies are traveling in style with Mikey as their chauffeur. Okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rod tries preparing a bottle of breast milk for the first time. I'm trying to like make a fake boob. Can't have these too hot. Holy, it just squirts out everywhere. No, that's good, want some more baby? Rod tackles the ultimate dad challenge. It's kind of working, eh, baby? And Emma Ray takes to the bottle hey, baby, like an baby, old pro. That, does that feel good? Hungry? Uh. 
across town, Chuck Adams is on the prowl. He's back at Buffalo, staying off the radar. Chuck needs his tools. He's trying to land a new job at another airline. What I'm gonna try doing is go work on some modern equipment for a different outfit. See how that goes. I miss working with the boys here, but time for a change in life, I would say. This could be the last time Chuck heads out Buffalo's door. Well, my new office is right in here. A week after this leaving Buffalo Airways, Chuck Adams has landed a new job across here. the airport at Adlair Aviation. Like Buffalo, it's a family-run operation. This is what we've been working on? With a small fleet based in Yellowknife and Cambridge Bay. This plane's from Medivac. There's three of them. There's the Lear jets outside, this one, plus there's another King Air in Cambridge. But maintaining a pint-sized King Air for medevac flights is a long way from fixing enormous Electras. So I'm going to work from Mack truck down to little dinky toys. They're, they're small, everything tiny. After the hectic atmosphere at Buffalo, working here means a huge change of pace. It's pretty quiet, eh? We only fly when the people are dying. So hopefully there's not a whole lot of people dying. But I'm not, I'm not in for the action anymore. I'm in for the sanity. He goes good there, and he goes to work every single day and makes his full day. Good for Chuck. Like, I'll be happy for him. It's like a big condom. He won't have to get his hands dirty on old piston pounders anymore. I could probably go to work with a suit, work all day, and come home clean. It's a totally different world. I just hope where he's, where he's at is, is maybe a little bit more stable than what he's used to here, and maybe you know, maybe you can have a little bit more of a life and not being stuck in weird towns fixing engines. They want a base engineer here in Yellow Lane. So it's gonna be me and the director of maintenance. I won't be traveling. Maybe once in a blue moon up at Cambridge, that's it. A quiet working life close to home could be just what the doctor ordered. It's all a matter of time to see how it goes. Things aren't so rosy at Buffalo. Wayne has staked the company's future on flying its turboprop Electras, but the planes need a lead mechanic. And there's no one who even comes close to Chuck's know-how. For now, Chuck's new job is peaceful, predictable, by the book. How long he can stand that is anyone's guess.